Laura McCullough Conti, thanks so much for coming back on to Talk Beliefs all the way from Melbourne, Australia. You've been on the show twice before, speaking out about growing up fifth generation of a secretive Christian sect known as the Two by Twos and your eventual escape. Today, we'll be catching up with your activism, including your ongoing work with the redress scheme of the Australian Royal Commission. And we'll also find out if you thought the recent Hulu documentary on the 2 by 2s was a successful expose of the cult's abuses or missed opportunity. Welcome back, Laura. I'm uh, glad to say that the more you speak out on this group, uh, the more awareness is being raised. Hello. Thank you for having me back for a third time. Can you believe how much has happened since we first spoke? I was reminiscing about how I had a tiny baby in the room the first time we spoke when we were catching up. So a lot has changed. And uh, the reactions now are quite different um, to when I first started speaking out, when I first did my episode with you, and it's changed again even from the second episode. Um, overwhelmingly, people believe survivors now when we speak about the group, which is great. And there's obviously still a segment which of you know created backlash against us who say we're exaggerating or we're bitter and we're not letting go in things because everything's changed now and it's much safer which it isn't which we can touch on in, i guess a little bit later in the show um there has been a little bit more mainstream news articles and a documentary that's come out of the us which you've just mentioned and all of these things have um, helped to raise awareness of the group and the ways perpetrators have been protected um yeah and all of that has has made my speaking out worthwhile and it's still important i think to speak out you know to programs like yours and to mainstream media and um and podcasts because there's still a lot to be uncovered with the group um, and it is a cult and there's still lots of abuse occurring so um yeah there's lots of things that have evolved my own life and my own my own work has evolved in the past five years and um, it continues to um and yeah the last few years have been a bit of a wild ride before we get an update on what is happening with your work, can you just remind people of who the two by twos are, your life within it, and why you had to leave? Yeah, the two by twos, which are also known as the truth, are a high control cultic religious group, which was started in Ireland in the late 1800s by a Scotsman called William Irvine. And they're very secretive. Uh, they've tried to hide the true origins of the group by claiming they go all the way back to the disciples and that they're the one true way and the only way into heaven. Um, they claim all other religious beliefs are false and theirs is the only way to be saved. And there's loads of similarities, you'll know, from your own work in this space and speaking to other people that there's similarities with the likes of the JWs and the Brethren and the Mormons. Um, and this idea that they have the one true way into heaven and everyone else is wrong. So they believe in exclusivity. They believe that they're the one true way. They, uh, the truth have very few written documents that outline their doctrine. Uh, they claim to be spirit-led, which is quite problematic because nothing is really written down. And we rely on people, on people we call workers who are a clergy um, to interpret things for us, which is how they came to be known as the two by twos, because they would go out two by two workers in pairs to stay in the homes of congregants called friends um, who, yeah, they're meant to be without money and possessions and to live in the homes of, of other people. Um, they're meant to be, you know, without money and without possessions, although that's questionable, except in the case of overseers, you know, in the case of overseers who seem to have quite comfortable lives and have access to quite a lot of the cash donations that um, lay people donate. The truth has, truth two by twos have very strict gender and sexuality roles, and it's quite difficult for women and girls and LGBTQI players plus people. Um, there's not a lot of space for us to exist. Very tightly controlled appearance um, regulations for us. Our hair and our dresses are, you know, very tightly controlled, and that we have to, yeah, um, typically behave and, and look in a very certain way. There is often in the communities I speak with a lot of control about women not wearing trousers, and women and girls must always wear dresses and have long hair. Um, and we seem to be sinning if we step outside those tightly controlled gender norms. Um, the very black and white view of the world, which often these groups are, that I know you profile on this show, um, they, it's them against the world. They're very conservative people. They often keep to themselves within their own communities. They um, often put up a very tight veneer of respectability, you know, this idea that um, they're very just nice little Christians, you know, who, who like hide behind this idea that they're, they're nice Christians. Um, and there's definitely a veneer of respectability. They're very tightly controlled, very abusive communities in my experience. They often shun TV and radio and try not to, you know, act too closely to the outside world. They do have the internet and laptops these days, but often workers will discourage lay people from looking into the too much or looking too much at worldly materials. Um, they rely, the main theological guidance is on the King James Bible and a hymn book. 
um, and also prolific letters and emails from workers and elders are circulated. Um, but because they're spirit-led, they rely very much on workers to translate things, to stay in your home, to give guidance um, and tell you how to interpret the King James Bible. And really without workers, you can't get into heaven, which is a bit of a problematic structure, um, as I know we've discussed on this program before, because um, you're at the behest of people who are staying in your homes who often don't have a lot of training um, and, you know, have a history of being abusive, um, spiritually abusive at the very least, but certainly there is endemic sexual abuse as well as a result of that structure. Um, and yeah, why did I leave? Well, I left because none of that is safe <laughs> and um, it wasn't a safe place for me to be. Um, and to be honest, I was excommunicated, really, if it boils down to it, because I was a young woman who wanted to lead a different kind of life and I wanted to be safe, really. I wanted to wear trousers and I wanted to cut my hair and I wanted to get an education and I wanted to run my own business and none of that was really suitable for a girl of my background. And I did try really hard to try and fit in, but I couldn't make it work. Um, and, and really I was pushed out and shunned out. Um, people just stopped talking to me. They would just pretend I didn't exist. Um, and they, yeah, they didn't like the choices I made about my appearance and my clothes and my education and they would, and they still do, cross the street to avoid me um, because I was seen as being worldly um, and led astray by the devil. Oh, it also must be said that I was queer and I did not feel comfortable with the gender and sexuality expectations of me. I did not want to get married and have children and, and there wasn't really a role for me if I didn't do that. Um yeah, so it wasn't safe, so I had to leave. Um, I experienced a whole lot of abuses, coercive spiritual control, sexual abuse, grooming, financial control, physical abuse, emotional abuse. It just really wasn't safe from a very young age. Um, so I didn't really feel like I had a choice. I felt like if I didn't leave, I, I probably wouldn't be, be able to survive. Um, and, yeah, I had to be somebody that I wasn't, so I got out. Yeah. <laughs> Laura, can you give us an overview on the history of abuse within the two-by-twos? Yeah, well, sadly, the truth slash two by twos have a really long history of enabling abuse, both by workers or clergy and by elders and lay people. Um, and sadly, it's not only historical, it's also happening now. It's still live. Um, there's a long history of complicity and cover up. There have been people who've been covering up and sweeping up abuses inside the group for a very long time. And as you would know, high control groups by their very nature are abusive. They coerce people into staying because if you leave, you, you may lose everyone. You may lose your friends, your family, your community, and sometimes also your job. And that's, a, you know, at its very core where it starts. Um, and if you have people who are too scared to leave because their salvation's at stake because they'll, they'll lose everything, well, from there often the behaviour's all downhill. Um, yeah, you end up with a group and they're not the only group. A lot of cultic and fundamentalist groups are this way, which sweeps away bad behaviour and abuse and control, harassment, harm to protect itself. Um, it's a self-protecting system. And, you know, uh, the truth is a group that teaches this very us and them black and white behaviour. So you end up with people who are terrified of the outside world. They're terrified of worldly authorities, which means abuses are often not reported to authorities. You know, and then you can overlay that with some other truth two by two specific things like the dangers of having workers staying in family homes, driving families cars, being around children and having unfettered access. You have vulnerable people who are dependent on workers for spiritual salvation. Um, and these workers are not adequately trained and they don't have adequate processes and, and uh, proper oversight. Um, the truth is an organisation which refuses to register itself as a proper organisation and proper church and it has no proper organised kind of corporate structure. No registrations, no charity status, no employee records, no volunteer records. It's a group that very until very recently used to refuse to acknowledge that it even existed. It would say to me that it was just a, a loose group of like-minded Christians who did a Bible study in the home. And so there's just so many layers to the ways that the truth has been unsafe and remains unsafe at its very core. You know, and there's been people who've done historical research into the group and can demonstrate that abuse and harassment and un, un, um, unequal power relations has been there from the very beginning. And you can look up Sherry Cropp's work and read her books and you find evidence that even the founder, William Irvine, back at the very start of the group was being inappropriate with women. So for decades, you know, this has been going on um, since the very start. My own family has, you know, had, had abuses covered up for decades. There were workers telling people in my family that they had to forgive and forget abuses, you know, to protect the reputation of the church or the group and the community around them and the family. There's been decades of examples of workers and elders moving predators from one community to another, covering up and silencing us. And unfortunately, that is still happening. 
um, survivors have been told en masse that we need to stay silent, that we've, yeah, and it's just caused layers and layers of intergenerational trauma and, and often repeat offenders have just been given free reign within the group to offend over and over again. And there's no way to stop them attending the services. Um, you know, workers and elders control who attends and they will let perpetrators in because they decide that they are worthy of salvation and they tell us that, you know, we are putting the spiritual salvation of these perpetrators at risk if we speak up and so we're too terrified to. Um, and, yeah, our workers really have the final say on this. And there's no way to stop that. Um, you, if you stand up and speak up, often you'll be shunned or excommunicated. So, yeah, and there's no formal church organisation, so there's no formal corporate governance structure that you can take it to in order to get workers fired or, you know, get perpetrators pushed out because there's none in existence. There's none under the law that you can use to, you know, I've tried, you can't. Um, they don't formally exist on paper. And I'll speak to it in a minute about the redress scheme, but, you know, there, there are people who've tried um, and it's, yeah, workers don't adhere to the very things that they say and there's no consequences. Workers will just nod and say, yes, 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 thank you for your information and then they'll work, walk away. Um, there's no consequences. It's not a safe organisation and has a very long history of abuse. You've made a submission to the Royal Commission regarding abuse within the 2 by 2 sect. Laura, can you explain how the redress scheme works, your claim against the 2 by 2s and how things are progressing? Uh, yeah, sure. So as you know, in many parts of the world, there's been uh, royal commissions into institutional or mostly church abuse, and then these redress schemes set up um, or in the process of being set up in some countries to compensate survivors they experienced abuse inside these institutions and churches. And it's a really good scheme on the whole. Um, unfortunately, the one in Australia, and I think in other parts of the world too, has, has not really taken into account that some cultic groups um, would not engage with the scheme in a very genuine way. And the Truth 2 by 2s is an example of that. And the Exclusive Brethren or the Brethren Christian Church and the Jehovah's Witnesses are another example here in Australia that I know your listeners will be familiar with, of groups that have also done disingenuous things to avoid accountability. So to begin with, um, in Australia, the overseas would just refuse to acknowledge me or engage with me or my claim. Um, so they, yeah, because they had no formal name and no formal registrations, they didn't need to engage with the scheme. They could just say they didn't know who I was and didn't know anything about me and um, that the group didn't exist. You know, they, they would say that they were just a loose group of like-minded Christians who did a Bible study in the home rather than an institution. Um, so, yeah, and they had no ABN, no tax registrations, no ASIC registrations, no charity registrations. So they, they'd just say they didn't need to engage with the group. They refused to engage with me because my family um, was from a border community um, at the time of one of the abuses or grooming instances occurred. So they would shuffle me between board, between state communities and say, oh, you need to speak to this one in this state. And then they would move me back again. So they would do everything they could not to engage with me and not to like be genuine about um, ensuring that I was heard and ensuring that, you know, that my claim was valid. Um, but basically since the fallout of um, Dean Brewer, who was an overseer that died in the US back in March 2023, which I know we discussed in the last episode, there was a, there's been a worldwide kind of change in the attitude of the overseers. And they've stopped denying that they exist and stopped refusing to engage. And they're now just doing a whole lot of other disingenuous things, which I'll get to in a moment. Uh, they're bleeding members, you know, at the moment because people are starting to stand up and say, like, my children are not safe in this group or I've experienced a group of abuse or you've covered up abuse. And so now they're stepping forward and saying, okay, so now, yeah, we, we accept that we do, we do exist. Um, and they're, you know, they are kind of a little bit more willing to have conversations now than they had been previously. They indicated to me in the last year, certainly since November last year, um, that they would sign up and um, yeah, I had a lot of kind of indications through family members inside the group that, yeah, the group was going to do everything they could to make sure they would sign up to the scheme and to ensure that survivors like me were given compensation. Um, and that's been a pretty awful <laughs> kind of fraught experience for me and it's not over yet because they've not signed up yet they have at least registered with the government and the government and them are in conversations about how they might be able to sign up to the scheme um but it isn't yeah it isn't a done deal um and i've you know had countless games played with me in the last 18 months over that and i i do hope that they will do what they have said they will do 
But um, unfortunately, they're doing it in a way which is weaponizing the scheme um, to make it appear that they're safe so that the existing members, um, yeah, don't keep leaving, right? They're bleeding members. And so now they're using the redress scheme as a way to play games, unfortunately. And they're telling people that the government has said that they are safe um, and the government has signed them off as being an okay place for children and vulnerable people. And the government most certainly has not. And that's not what the government is signing up for. The government, that language is very manipulative. And even if they are signed up to the scheme, the government are not aware of how manipulative and disingenuous they're being with it. They're using it and they're weaponizing it, unfortunately. And I don't actually know the full story of what they're feeding their parishioners about the redress scheme. Um, and, you know, but there's so much, and there's so much I'm not able to find out because of privacy laws. But um, you know, I, there has to be a registered entity that they are engaging with the government with. The government needs there to be a registering functional institutional corporate entity before they can engage with them. They need to have child safety policies and employment records and volunteer records. And if the government signs them up, then what is this corporate institution? What is this corporate entity that they are using to engage with the government? Because our, our, our people are not aware of that. That Where is it? What is it? Um, yeah, why is it a secret? Why do none of us know what this entity is? Why, why do none of us know what the employee records are? Like, why is that a secret? If that's what they're doing to engage with the scheme, like people need, need to start asking, well, what is your bit tax registration number? What is your charity registration? What is your registered name with the government? Because right now that's not known. So, you know, there's a very big smoke and mirrors game going on, which makes me very sad and very angry. And personally, I think they've created a corporate shell entity which they have no intention of holding any assets or any money or any employees or any volunteer records. And it's all just been set up as a shell to make it look like they're doing the right thing for the government so they can tell their parishioners and their followers that they have done it. But it's not real and it's not genuine. Um, and it is really hard for me to watch them do this because, you know, I mean, other entities are doing this as well. Like this is not only the truth doing this, other disingenuous groups are doing it as well with these redress schemes. Because I, you know, I set out about six years ago because I wanted the group to be safer. I wanted people to be safe from predators, from coercion and abuse. And I really feel like in, in what they're doing, which is probably setting up a shell entity, that I'm failing. Like I'm allowing them to manipulate the government and then feed that back into friends and family. Um, and, and make it look like it's safer when it's not. So I, yeah, I feel that it's been a pretty big failing um, and I don't feel great about it. Um, it's very hard to watch and hear them being, you know, them being so disingenuous. And it's really hard to hear people inside be complicit in this and to help this continue, to help it cover up and not be genuine. And I, it must be said there's men and women doing this and that hurts as well to know that there are women enabling this behavior. Um, and that, yeah, the redress scheme really has has not done a good job of managing groups like the truth, two by twos, which are cultic, um, and it has allowed them to misbehave pretty badly. The two by two church have responded to claims of abuse against it by launching a website that assures the public that the sect is doing everything it can to deal with the abuse within its walls. Laura, what is your take on this new website? Ah. Uh. Well, I hope that I can talk about this without crying or becoming overly emotional or angry. <laughs> My apologies in advance if I can't. Because, um, yeah, it's actually really difficult to speak about. It makes me very angry and very sad depending on what day of the week it is. Um, because it goes to the core of why this group is still unsafe and why my work still continues and why their engagement with the government redress scheme is so disingenuous. Um, you know, and there's been a wave of people demanding that workers and overseers support survivors and that they remove predators from the group. And, you know, those people, those wave of people are both current members and people who've left, it must be said, it's both. And so overseers have responded by playing another round of games and this website is another game. And it's another game that's been used, much like the redress scheme has been used as window dressing. And it's a game. And, you know, as part of the redress scheme, they uh, there is a series of things they have to do to demonstrate that they are supporting survivors. And I feel like this website is one of those things. It is a joke. Um, it's not even appropriately named or indexed with SEO on Google. 
Like a current member could not find this website if they wanted to. If they wanted to get guidance on how to report somebody, if they wanted to know what to do if somebody was being unsafe in their home, how to report a predator turning up in their Sunday meeting, they would not be able to find this address. Like it's called AUSNZ info, OSNZ info.com. What the, excuse my language, fuck does that even mean? Like that just, that's not the name of a church. That's not the name of an entity. That's not the name of anything. It's completely fluffy. It's like how you would never be able to find this website if you did not know it existed. And let me assure you, current friends and parishioners will not know this website exists. It's been done very deliberately that it cannot be found. It like it, it this again, no registered church entity, nothing on this website that indicates what group it even refers to. And it's been done deliberately. It is deliberately vague so that nobody can find information on it. Workers know that. Overseers know that. People who are helping be complicit in this know that. It's um it's deliberately obscure and it's a gaslighting tool and it's highly manipulative and it's very, very upsetting to watch, to be honest. Because, you know, the other thing is that friends and, and followers of the Truth 2 by 2s are discouraged from even looking on the internet too much. I mean, they're just told not to search for information. They're told that, you know, it, it's not, the information on the internet's not safe. They're not even going to go to the internet and see this website, even if they knew of it, its existence. It is all a game. And, it, you know, it lists out all of these policies and documents and letters but they're pointless because there's no corporate entity that it's known that any of these policies feed into so if they didn't if they broke any of these policies or they didn't follow any of these things that they say on the website there's no accountability there's no point to it and there's all these letters that like overseers have, and workers have written it's just it's actually really gross um and i often can't look at the website without becoming quite upset um at how manipulative and how um how much of a gaslighting exercise it is um and you know the other thing is that as part of their address scheme they need to offer apologies to survivors and they've got this apology letter like smacked on the website very vague apology letter not naming anybody not you know acknowledging like how many survivors there are and how much they've swept under the carpet and so it feels like it's a tool like to go oh hey government redress scheme here's our apology letter look at our website we've said sorry to survivors which just feels quite gross and quite insulting, to be honest. Um, yeah, it's. I feel quite sick thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, and it gives the appearance of change when, in fact, absolutely nothing has changed. And I know that the group isn't safer because I still have young people and vulnerable people, LGBTQI plus people, reaching out to me for help. I still hear stories of horrendous things happening, of abuse, of control, of coercion I, I pay from people from girls who are too scared to wear trousers or too scared to look things up on the internet too scared to talk to police about abuse I, like I hear from people still who are being abused and and sent and people workers sending people back into unsafe situations this is not historical it's still happening and all the while there's this pointless website that nobody could even find no none of the followers of the truth to by truth could even find this website and even if they did find it and report something where does it go like it should be going to the police not into this website anyway like it's it uh, it's very frustrating you know and all the while perpetrators are still turning up to meetings and there's communities where workers have set up very special meetings for perpetrators to attend because they care more about their salvation than they do about survivors or than they do about making sure families are safe and and people are safe um it's all horribly sad to be honest um and yeah while there's people like me who have increasingly started speaking out the backlash from people inside is still very real. The backlash from people who think that this website is amazing is very real. Um, and they, they will continue to discredit survivors like me and they will call us bitter and they will say that we are undermining them when in fact they are supporting a group which has put out a very manipulative website. Um, and like they're just conning everybody into believing that they're safer when all they're doing is contributing to sweeping it away. You know, there's still no counselling support for survivors. There's no fund for recovery funds for like like people who've left the group or people who are recovering from the group or have been abused. 
you know what, I'm lucky and then I have a career and then I can afford support, but lots of people can't. You know what, I will get some very small payment probably from the redress scheme, but most survivors would not go through the scheme. And I I don't know that I would encourage survivors to go through the scheme um, because it's a long traumatic process and I don't, uh, it's been a pretty awful process. So um, yeah, I, the workers in the overseas, if there's been no meaningful apology and no meaningful engagement with me at all or other survivors for that matter, um, there's no change of behaviour. They just continue on as normal. They've smacked this website up and they're claiming to be caring about survivors. Um, and I guess the other thing is that they're also claiming to have engaged an independent external party to review their child safety policies and their complaints handling policies. And that's pretty heartbreaking to watch because they've actually put the name of this external party up um, and they have not engaged properly with this external party either. They've not given them the background of who the group is. They've not told the external party that they're not a registered organisation. They've not told them that they don't have proper employee records. So they, they're weaponising this external party as well to say, oh, they're reviewing our child safety policies. But they haven't given this external party the full story about what, what the context is of these child safety policies. And, you know, I've actually tried to reach out to that group to say to them, like, do you realise whose child safety policies you're engaging, like you're reviewing, um, and to find out who is paying for this external review, for instance. But it is very hard to get information and because of confidentiality laws, they can't tell me who's paying for it. Um, and all they can say is that they are reviewing their policies and procedures. Um, and you've got to hope that in part of reviewing those policies and procedures, this external company will say, well, who is the corporate entity that sits over the top of these policies? Because otherwise they are pointless. But of course, you don't know that that's going to happen either um, because they're being paid and who knows what the scope of the work is. So anyway, there's just so many layers to the way that the, the overseers and the group is weaponizing, um, yeah, processes and external parties and websites because this is what cults do, right? <laughs> They're constantly manipulative and disingenuous. Um, but it is very frustrating to watch them do this over and over again. <laughs> There is a price to be paid every time a survivor shares their story. I think um, it's so hard to live every day feeling like, you know, like I must be broken. I had just turned 14. And it was scary. It was scary. I will not be silenced. This church has been alive for decades, and the next thing you know... All hell breaks loose. What is the two-by-two two church? It is a secret sect. It flies under the radar. If you don't agree with them, your salvation is at stake. A stunning amount of information has come out about the misdeeds of some of the ministers. These same people preaching this message were the ones hiding horrific horrific things. Do you feel the church accepted abuse? I wouldn't say accepted it as so much pretended it didn't exist. Yep, that's him. Yep. Ready? Kira Phillips with ABC News. Did you sexually abuse Shariatri when she was 14 and you were 28? No comment. Do you believe your church protected you? Does your church protect sexual predators? The powerful new Impact by Nightline. So the church saw itself as judge and jury. There's nothing pretty about hearing this Secrets of the 2 by 2 Church, now streaming only on Hulu. Just last month, June 2024, an episode of Impact by Nightline on Hulu was released called Secrets of the 2 by 2s Church. Now, there aren't very many documentaries on this sect, so this must have been of real interest to you. So what did you think of the episode, and did it do everything you hoped it would do? Oh, yeah, I'm a huge fan of anyone who gets something published on this group. Um, anyone, anywhere. <laughs> all the spotlight and all the pressure it, like makes it a huge difference. So the more heat on them, the better. Um, it's the only way I've found you can get change, even if it's only a small amount of change um, in this group, is to shame them and put heat on them, and that's the sad reality. So uh, I think the documentary is great. Um, I've watched it probably about five times now. Um, it tells the stories, you know, of survivors, the same ones that I've been telling for years and that many, many of us have been saying for a long time. Um, and there's lots of important statements in that documentary, you know, like that if you don't agree with the workers, your salvation is at stake, um, which is why people stay. And it's a cultic group because predators are allowed to stay because your salvation is at stake. 
And there's lots of great reiteration of the gaslighting and the shunning, the bullying, the excommunication if you speak out. Um, it reiterates a lot of the shuffling of perpetrators from area to area rather than removing them, although it must be said that it's in a US and Canadian context rather than Australian, but, you know, the same behaviour is happening all over the world. So it's a really good summary of the background and the ongoing issues of the group, um, and it's commendable. Like it, it really reiterates that the group thinks it's above the law and the manipulative kind of nature of the overseers. Um, it points out a lot of the things I've been saying about the role of women and girls, that we are expected to be subservient, to be quiet and small, that we're constantly silenced and shut down. And it points out, as I've said, about many, many people over many, many decades trying to talk about abuse and perpetrators. Um, and some of the perpetrators have, you know, as a, in this says in this documentary, they've actually admitted to the abuse, but um, they've been allowed to stay in the cult. Um, and many of those abusers have had that abuse framed as mutual or intimacy or just a mistake rather than what it was, like abuse, you know, it was CSA, you know, the abuse of women and girls and LGBTQIA people, it, like it, it really makes that point. So I really do value that. There's a couple of little things that I would like to have seen done differently. Like there was a man who was profiled in there who is an ex-worker um, and I wouldn't have done that. There's lots of people who probably could have told their story in a bit of a different way in place of him um, and I don't understand why they chose to profile him because he has a bit of a alleged history himself of not being a celibate minister, which is a bit of an abuse of power in my opinion since he was a spiritual, you know, guider as a worker. Um, so choosing to include him was a bit odd but it is what it is too late now. Um, it also probably missed a bit about talking about the backlash and, you know, it is hard to cover all these issues um, in a short, sharp documentary, but um, there's a lot of backlash that a lot of us have endured for speaking up that's very painful. I would like that to have been spoken about. Um, the ways that, you know, we've been doxxed and our safety is often being compromised. There's a lot of coercion and abuse that we've endured for speaking up. Um, you know, I have CPTSD from my experience of leaving the group. Like the backlash is pretty fierce against us and I would love that to be discussed more. Um, yeah, maybe a bit more about complicity. You know, there's a lot of people complicit um, who've helped cover up abuse and there's many, many of those people who've helped cover up our women um, and that's pretty hard to cope with and I, I wish was discussed more because um, there's a lot of women who are allowing vulnerable people and children to be abused like, and they'll look the other way. Um, but nonetheless, I think the survivors on that show are very brave. Um, as with all survivors of the Truth 2x2s, two two, I'm, I'm amazed that they've spoken up and I'm very grateful for their bravery um, because I know the great expense that speaking up comes with to our health and to our network and, to you know, you're often further shunned and excommunicated. So um, I know. I know what that's like and so I'm very grateful for, ha for them having spoken up in that documentary. Well, it's an ongoing battle for activists like you to see that injustices within this church and ones like it are identified and called out. So what positive steps are being made and what do you hope all of this work is leading to? Yeah, well, it's been a long, sometimes difficult years, few years for me. I won't lie about that. Um, I didn't set out to be an activist, which I probably said in the last episode as well. Um, and the last 18 months has been interesting to watch more and more people walk away from the truth two by twos and more people, you know, willing to support survivors um, and more people willing to speak up themselves about being a survivor of the group. Um, I'm really hopeful that people will continue to leave this this group and that people will realise it's not a safe group and it can't be made safe. Um, I do unfortunately think the group will always exist and I don't think it will die out the way some people would like it to. Um, I think it probably will morph into something even more dangerous and hardcore, to be honest. I don't like saying that, but I do think what will be left after this current round of people leave will be a much more hardcore, devout following than it was you know a decade ago um so unfortunately i don't think my work advocating for survivors of this group will be done anytime soon unfortunately um i do as i've said before also hear from people who are still inside about things happening now and i do know that in a decade's time there will be another round of kids coming out of this group who will tell another round of awful stories um because it's not safe like it's still heartbreaking to hear some of the stuff happening in there um and yeah, it's not it's not even close to being safe. Um, I did think when I set out that I could make it safer through the redress scheme, but I can't. I can't. It's it's a cold. It can't be made safe. 
Um, so I have to accept that. I have to accept that they're playing games, they're manipulative, and they'll try to make it look like they're changing when they're not and they're just protecting the status quo. Um, overseas have way too much power and control to give that up and to implement real change. So what does all that mean for me? Well, it means that I keep going and I find some way to do it for the long haul. And I think a lot about this. I think a lot about like, how do I do this um, and not become burned out and exhausted, especially after my experience of the redress scheme. Um, and because, you know, I'm, I'm much more than, than what happened to me in this group, my, my leaving of this group, my abuse in this group, my advocacy in this group, like I'm, I'm more than that. I'm bigger than that. So, um, you know, I've started working with cults and cult conversations more broadly, um, with cult family and community violence issues more broadly, outside of the Truth 2 by 2 context. Um, and I'm excited to be going to DCult, which is an anti-cult conference in New Zealand later this year, um, to speak and to connect with a broader kind of anti-cult spiritual coercion group of leaders and activists. Kia ora, I'm Anke Richter, the author of Cult Trip, and I spent many years researching the trauma of former children from Centerpoint and Gloria Vale. Now I'm bringing you an exciting event. Get ready for DECALT 2024, the first CALT conference here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, this October. We've invited international experts around the world, authors, activists, academics, and CALT survivors to all share their stories and their expertise. If you're worried about a friend or family member who is in a group that might be causing them harm, or you have your own experience, then come and listen and learn at DECAL 2024. See you there. Um, I'm interested in exploring getting a cult register considered here in Australia to help government, you know, and advocating to government to help set up a register so that the community can be more aware of cultic organisations and you know, more aware and educated to avoid them or support people leaving them. So it's about broadening my own reach and I've been yeah, doing TikTok and um, other news articles and attending these cult education events and talking about coercive control and spiritual control. And I guess I continue to keep doing that um, and, yeah, I keep advocating and raising awareness about issues inside the two-by-twos and levers of two-by-twos. Yeah, so actually, for instance, um, many followers of The Truth and ex-friends here in Australia don't actually know there's an F open FBI investigation into the group um, because often they are still kept in the dark about information like that. So there is actually, I'll say that here and put a link in the show notes, there is an open FBI investigation into The Truth 2 by 2s So if you have any information, no matter where you are in the world, about the group covering things up, hiding things, things that you suspect, um, yeah, you can contact the FBI through this form and leave information um, and I will send it through to you. So you can put it in the show notes um, after the show. So, yeah, for me, well, I guess I'm, yeah, trying to work out how to be involved in cult advocacy more broadly, um, how to talk about it on TikTok, from, you know, how to raise awareness about coercive control. And I'm also working on telling my own story and in publishing more of my own stories and experiences because, I, as I said before, I'm much more than and, and bigger than what is scripted to me. And... Um, I'm determined to build something really powerful and really beautiful um, outside of what they did to me. I'm going to be bigger than that. Laura McConnell-Conti, thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much for having me for a third time. Um, so much happening in this group and um, it's always so nice to speak on this program. And um, I know that you get really good views of ex-members and maybe even some sneaky current members who can be sure. So I look forward to the comments and reading what people say. <laughs> <laughs>